right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. I want to give a big shout out to all the camera classrooms who we have hanging out backstage, and I can see we've got a nice big group uh, joining us on the live stream via YouTube. So wherever you're located in the world, use that comment section, give us a big shout out, let us know where you're tuning in from, uh, and of course, get a few questions ready for our Q&A action. So today we're continuing an exciting 10 event series exploring amazing places around the world with Darwin 200. This is all just a warm up to the epic Darwin 200 expedition departing in August 2023 that will travel uh, the ocean by tall ship following Darwin's voyage of the Beagle. In today's event, we're going to explore the island of Madagascar. So located off the coast of Africa and the Indian Ocean, this island is home to an incredible wealth of biodiversity including many plant and animal species found nowhere else on the planet. So right now to get things started, I'm gonna throw things over uh, to Stuart McPherson. He is the project leader for Darwin 200. He's a naturalist, author, and television presenter. Let's get him in live here right now. Hey, Stu, how are you doing today? All very good, thank you. It's lovely to speak to you. How's everyone at school? Stu, it's so great to be doing this live today. We have a big group tuning in uh, via YouTube. I think they're excited to jump into a little bit of Madagascar, learn a bit about Darwin 200, and then we're going to announce some competition winners a little bit later. That's great. Uh, Madagascar is one of the most amazing places in the world. And so hopefully um, students across the world will enjoy learning about this um, unbelievable country. So um, without further ado, let's get started. If I can share, can you sh share my screen, Joe? If I, um, can you see Baobabs, hopefully? Is that coming through? We got it. We're ready. Beautiful. All righty. I'm going to give a quick overview of Madagascar, then hand over to Joe. And we, we're absolutely honored to have an incredible conservationist called, um, called Travis, who's going to kindly speak about his work as well. But just really quickly, this is an overview of Madagascar. So for those that don't know, Madagascar lies off the coast of Africa. It's often known as the eighth continent because it simply has some of the most unusual and amazing animals on Earth. There's two main reasons for this. It's been isolated for millions upon millions of years, about 88 million years. And it also has an incredibly diverse landscape of habitats. I'm sure many of you students know this, but the longer an island is isolated, generally the more diverse um, and more, the more the animals and plants can evolve and develop in those ecosystems. But in Madagascar, it's especially different because, because it's such a large island, it's one of the largest islands in the world, it's almost a continent in its own self. It has such a different range of ecosystems. Um, okay, this is a generalization, but generally up in the north, you've got some deciduous areas. That means areas where it's seasonally dry, where some of the trees drop their leaves. Down on the east coast, you've got wet areas with some rainforest and really wet perma-humid areas. In the middle, you've got some dry upland areas. And down in the, the southwest, there's an incredible unique habitat called spiny forest that occurs nowhere else in the world. This is so, so special. It is honestly like going to another planet. This is a drone shot of what it looks like. It, it's known for these unique trees. They're called aloadia trees or octopus trees because their unique branches go upright a bit like an octopus's arms. And when you walk in it, it honestly feels like walking in Mars. The trees are like nothing else you've seen anywhere else in the world. They have these tiny little leaves. Um, these are Alawadi on the left and Pacopodium on the right, which is another group. And um, another group called Dederea that have these huge spines. And some of the lemurs that you're going to hear about later from Travis actually jump between these trees. I've been to Madagascar about 20 times and I still don't understand how any, any animal, any big animal can jump between these spiny trees and land without having their feet cut to pieces. It's absolutely incredible. And so that's how spiny some of the spiny forest trees can be. Um, and they say all of their branches are covered in these big spines and their little leaves are between the spines protected from herbivores. So protect or trying to be protected from herbivores. The island is also really well known for its baobabs. Um, you might have seen these in The Lion King or in obviously the film Madagascar. These these huge trees with big swollen stems that look a bit like bottles. And they are like bottles in a sense, they store water. They've got special spongy tissue inside their trunks that rapidly absorb water when it rains. 
and store it during the dry times. So you can, in, in a way, think of them a bit like bottles, but they can survive for, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, even thousands of years. They are incredible trees. Well, the landscapes on Madagascar are just out of this world. It's famous for unique formations called singi. Um, these are red singi, and more common are these gray singi. That these ones are limestone blades that have been carved and eroded by water action and chemistry actually within the water, carbonic acid within the rainwater. And it forms these unbelievable landscapes of knife-like blades of limestone. It's really out of this world. Anyway, that's the landscapes, but the animals and plants are even more unusual. So as I mentioned earlier, Madagascar is known as the eighth continent. And one of the reasons for this is because it has so many unique animals and plants that simply occur nowhere else in the world. And I'm just going to run through a few of them just to give you a little bit of, of a taste um, before, before obviously Travis um, gives an overview of his, his work. So some, just a few of the amazing animals that occur nowhere else in the world are Tenrex. And they look a little bit like hedgehogs. Those are the schools joining from here in the UK will be familiar with hedgehogs. They look like hedgehogs, but absolutely are not closely related at all. But just like hedgehogs, they can roll up in balls as well, protected by their spines. Well, Madagascar is world famous for its chameleons. It has dozens and dozens of species of chameleons, more so than the rest of the world put together by far. And um, this one is a panther chameleon. And as I'm sure as you know, chameleons are amazing because they can change color dramatically. It depends upon the species. And in some cases, it depends upon even populations within the species uh, that, that can vary quite a bit. But this one in particular, the panther chameleon, is one of the best color changes. And he can, he can change almost any color of the rainbow. It's incredible. Um, as can the carpet chameleon. This is a really colorful one. But not all chameleons are colorful. Some have really good camouflage to hide away on branches, uh, such as this one here. And um, others are absolutely tiny. These are Brachysia chameleons um, from the north of Madagascar, from Amber Mountain. And they're in, they're in total length, just about one and a half centimeters, two centimeters long. So less than an inch long. And that's their adult size. And remember, these are vertebrates. They're not insects. They're vertebrates. They have a beating heart. They have bones. They have eyes. They have nerves. It's incredible when you think how tiny their little bones are and their little, little, their little movements are as, as they move along. Well, a few of the other animals, from tortoises to really amazing insects and invertebrates, such as the giraffe beetles that have evolved really long necks. There's an incredible group called the leaf-tailed geckos that have some of the best camouflage on Earth. Um, just look at the tail. It's shaped like a leaf. Um, different parts along its body have flanges and its feet and even its eyes, because there's generally no straight lines in nature. Even its pupils, which in normal geckos are straight, in these guys are, are like um, a zigzaggy, so it, it doesn't stand out. Their camouflage is amazing. Well, <laughs> one of the last animals we'll look at very quickly in this overview, of course, are the lemurs. Lemurs make Madagascar shine. Um, you, you might know lemurs are primates. They belong to the same family as, as monkeys and apes and bonobos and so forth, our closest relatives. But actually, lemurs also belong to this group but just a very, very, very ancient group of them. There's many, many, many shapes, uh, species of lemurs that come in all shapes and sizes. For those of you that have watched um, Madagascar, the film, this guy is King Julian, um, one of the most beloved of all the, of all of the lemur, lemur species, the, the ring-tailed lemur. But there's also many, many others, the Indri Indri. This is the biggest species of all. Uh, many, this is the brown lemur. There's many species, including nocturnal ones, uh, like Mort, also from the Madagascar film. And last but not least, the Ai that we're going to see a film on later. This is simply one of the most amazing and unusual animals on Earth. Um, it, it lives in darkness and has a strange, strange skeletal finger that you're going to hear about later. And uh, sorry, here's another shot of the leaf-tailed gecko, just how incredible that camouflage is. Well, lastly, I guess I want to introduce the Fusa, so Madagascar has an incredible carnivore that kind of looks a bit like a cat, but like so many of Madagascar's animals, it's not a cat. It evolved totally separately. It's its own group. And that's a trend you'll see again and again and again on this incredible island, these unique animals and plants that might look a little bit like other animals and plants in the rest of the world, 
but actually a totally different. And that also goes with the plants. There are amazing plants that catch and kill insects and other animals. And for the winners of the competition um, coming up that we're going to announce later, we're going to send you some of these. They're called nepenthes, the carnivorous pitcher plants um, that catch and kill insects and other small animals. So that was a super duper quick overview of, um, of Madagascar and just a few of the amazing animals and plants that this incredible island has to offer. So I think I'm handing back to Joe now for a Cahoots quiz. So thanks. All for right. Stu, thank you so much. That was a great little overview to get us started and bring us into that amazing uh, land of biodiversity with so many endemic species, species found nowhere else uh, on the planet. So cool. Uh, we are going to get ready to rock and roll with a little Kahoot action before we meet our primatologist guest, Travis Steffens. I'm going to share a little banner here to show you how you can take part in the Kahoot. You need to head to Kahoot.it. So you can just punch that in uh, in your browser, and then it's going to ask you for a PIN number. There it is on the screen, 550242. That'll bring you right into the Kahoot. If you have one-to-one -one devices, uh, you can absolutely use those at your seat. If not, your teacher could pop this up at the front of the room and you could shout out your answers to him or her. I'm gonna bring up another screen here that'll show us the pin number and show us we have a lot of students joining us already, which is great. Uh, you can see we have our auto-generated animal names like the fuzzy egret and the decisive cat. Uh, who else do we have here? The dandy stork, very cool, the jolly bear. So I've got four questions teed up, two true and false, two multiple choice, 20 seconds for each question. The quicker you get your right answer in, the more points you're going to get. If you get that wrong answer in and you're the fastest, well, we still got nothing for you. You got to get those answers right. And as we do with these events, there will be three prizes for the top three finishers. One, two, three of an Amazon gift card. So if you were in the classroom, um, you can have your teacher send an email. I'll put my email uh, in a link. Uh, and you can reach out to us and we will get you that Amazon gift voucher. So lots on the stake today. Lots of students still joining us. Uh, Stu, how many times have you visited Madagascar? About 20 or so over the years, over the wow. last two decades or so. It's an amazing country. I love it there so much. As I'm sure, I'm sure Travis is the set feels the same. We'll hear from him shortly. But, um, but yeah, it's such an incredible place. All right, Travis, we have a big group of students and groups joining. We're up over 200 and it's still going up <laughs> pretty quickly. So maybe I'll ask you another question here while we're, we give it just another moment to see if things slow down a little bit. Um, we're going to watch a little video uh, about the II a little bit later on today. So uh, I wonder if you can kind of warm us up for that and tell us a little sure. bit about this crazy nocturnal lemur species. So the eye is like no other animal on earth. You're gonna see it later. Um, it, it's a bit of a sad story because it had quite a wide distribution across Madagascar, but it was it was seen as this, this scary, almost demon-like creature. And across much of Madagascar, it, it was unfortunately killed. No other than really that there were taboos against it and people were afraid of it. So it got pushed out for most of its range, um, which is a great, great shame. There's some good projects to conserve it now, and it, it does occur in many national national parks and, and preserves. Um, but um, the, the little film that you're going to go and see, we're going to see shortly, showcases this unbelievable animal. And I say it's got quite a few secrets up its sleeves, a really weird finger that you're going to find out about later that it uses for a very special reason. So, yeah, it, it really is like nothing else on the planet. It's a very strange animal. All right. Well, I think we're ready. I can still see students trickling in, but we've got to keep moving because we've got lots of great stuff to share here. Uh, so here we go. Our first question coming up, 20 seconds on the clock. True or false? Madagascar is sometimes called the eighth continent. Is that true? or is that false? We got our answers flying in here. We've still got about 10 seconds to get your answer in. True or false, Madagascar is sometimes called the eighth continent. All right, great job crew. Overwhelmingly, we went with true. Let's see who's holding down that top spot. The diplomat deer. Let's wow. go to our next question. Another true and false on deck. 
Madagascar has the least amount of chameleon species in the world. True or false? Madagascar has the least amount of chameleon species in the world. I know one thing I love is watching them hunt. It's absolutely yeah. incredible how quickly that tongue uh, can fire out and accurate. Absolutely. It's such a weird thing, isn't it, that tongue? It's amazing. All right. Good job, crew. That is false. We learned that it's the largest uh, amount of species. Very cool. The diplomat deer is holding on. We're going to our next question. It is a multiple choice about how many species of lemurs are there? 13, 25, 45, or around 100? About how many different species of lemurs are there in Madagascar? About a dozen, 25, 45, or up over 100? Oh, we had a wide spread there. This should definitely shake up our leaderboard. It is over a hundred species. Let's see what happened there. The genius zebra has snatched the lead. And we've got one more question for all the glory. What do we call a species found in only one place on the planet? Is it a pandemic species? Is it an endemic species? Is it a nocturnal species? Or is it a diurnal species? What do we call a species that we only find one place on the planet? One location. All right, another little bit of a split, but most went with endemic, which is absolutely correct. Let's look at our podium. In third place, we have the hero hare. In second place, we've got the knowing goat. Uh, and in first place, we have the dandy horse wow in the end very very <laughs> cool i'm going to come back from that screen share i'm going to share my email as well on the screen here so if you are in one of those three classrooms get your teacher to send me uh, an email and we will make sure that we get uh that gift card coming your way there we go that was pretty cool Stu. that was amazing well done everyone you guys have got such good knowledge already about madagascar and those, right. those gift cards, you can use them for anything you want. They're 50 pounds or 60, 60 US dollars or, or so. Um, and yeah, you can use them for anything that you want for your class. So you could buy materials, artwork, resources, whatever you want. So um, well done to all those winners. All right. So there's my email down there in the banner. Stu, I'm going to tuck you away temporarily. Sure. We're going to bring Travis in and we're going to talk a little conservation and see some of the cool biodiversity that Travis uh, has seen in his uh, explorations of Madagascar. So coming in with me now is Travis Steffens. He is a primatologist. He is uh, studies lemurs in Madagascar. He is the founder of Planet Mad Madagascar, which is an incredible uh, non-for-profit that not only protects ecosystems uh, in Madagascar, but also works with the community, providing jobs for the community, also uh, things like healthcare, education, really encouraging them to protect the environment around them. Let's bring Travis in live. Hey, Travis, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. It's always great to have you with us. Uh, you get to work uh, in a cr pretty incredible place. You get to visit, you get to work with amazing community members, uh, and you get to see these incredible species. Yeah, it's very, very privileged to get to do this. I'm just excited to share it with everybody. All right, well, we'll let you take over for a little bit. Okay, let me push some buttons. Pushing buttons, technology. All right, I see it loading up. Let's go to the beginning. Well, there we go. All right, we're ready. So just like Stu said, yes, this place is incredible. Uh, it's, and it's why we named our organization Planet Madagascar, because it's like visiting uh, a, a new world. You're going to an, an island that's like a new planet. And in that place, we have a lot of things like interesting insects and a few arachnids, some lovely lizards, some beautiful birds, um, some leaping liver, lizards, uh, oh, sorry, leaping lemurs, and of course, the conservation work that uh, myself and many people in Madagascar are doing trying to protect all of these things. 
Uh, let's start with some of the weird insects that I've had the privilege of hanging out with. This is a collection of bugs. And as Stu mentioned, the landscapes look like uh, you're on Mars. Well, some of the insects look like Martians wearing shredded wedding dresses. This insect will actually eat nectar from the tree. It poops sugar and lemurs eat that uh, sweetened poop that these insects deposit on the ground, um, filled with a little bit of this bitter fuzz uh, that's meant to protect the insect itself. That fuzz will fall off and you end up with a, a red leaf bug like this. And if you look up close, it's basically the exact same form as the previous uh, version. It just doesn't have the white uh, fuzzy shell on it that protects it during its juvenile years. Um, uh, the draft necked uh, beetle that we, we saw previously, another incredible animal that uh, were males with these ridiculous long necks. Such an unusual creature found in the eastern parts of Madagascar. Although not an insect, this weird arachnid is a, a, a web-throwing spider who makes an intricate net just like a normal spider, but the, the web itself has no glue. And so it, uh, it, can, it can tighten it up into a net, and when something flies past, it'll throw it at that insect and catch it in and reel it in for its dinner. Just a weird, unusual creature. Again, one of these weird things you only find in Madagascar. Um, Next up would be a video. I'll let you listen. We're continuing in Mitsinju National Park, Pierre spotted a leaf-tailed gecko. It's one of the hardest species to find in Madagascar. It took me almost 10 minutes before I saw it. It's an amazing creature. Perfectly blends in with its surroundings. It's one of the most cryptic animals in the entire country. One of the most cryptic animals in the world. And it's one of the neat things that you can come see when you visit Madagascar. So, of course, these are tough to find on your own, and th thankfully, some incredible guides that know their way around forests and know the types of trees to look for. I have never found one of these myself. I have been to Madagascar a number of times since 2007. I've never, ever seen one without the help of a guide, but every now and then you get lucky, and there's one on a big leaf, so you can get a nice, beautiful photo of them. But like Stu said, they're perfectly camouflaged to blend in with their environment. It's just an amazing creature. Um, the chameleons we saw before, I want to add a couple others or and some familiar ones that we've seen already, like this rhinoceros chameleon who happened to live above my tent when I was doing my research. I think he looked at me kind of embarrassingly because my nose was much smaller than his. Uh, there's also the, the one of the larger chameleons in, in Madagascar, and I'm going to show a video at the end of it throwing its tongue like the photo on the side here. And of course, you, you got to meet the Burkizia chameleons or these micro chameleons, the tiniest lizards on the world. So let's watch the chameleon do what chameleons do best, throwing their tongue, getting a little bit of uh, dinner. Yum. Now I call those forest shrimps. It looks delicious, and that's how you get a meal. Well, besides uh, uh, lovely lizards, we also got some beautiful birds like this, this uh, crested um, uh, cuckoo, and you have uh, some in, uh, 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 a number of other small birds and big birds that exist throughout Madagascar. It's about 300 species, half of them only found on the island, including this forest foodie on the top left. The top right, you have a Madagascar kingfisher. The bottom left is a member of the, the birds called the vongas. This is a sickle-billed vonga, and that entire family is only found in Madagascar. And the, on the right, the fish eagle, or the Madagascar fish eagles, similar to many fish eagles around the world. But you go to Madagascar often because you want to see lemurs, and there are over a hundred species of lemurs, as you learn from that quiz. And they form all shapes and sizes. You may recognize the ring-tailed lemur because they're commonly found in captivity. Um, but you get everything from this tiny little diminutive uh, mouse lemur. It's the smallest primate in the world. It can be about the size of an egg and can fit in the palm of your hand. You can have things like the uh, a furry little grogu. This is a sportive lemur that spends its days in tree holes. And at night, it's a nocturnal animal will come out and leap through the trees looking for food. As I said, in the day, it's in the tree holes and it sinks down on the hole to hide itself from predators. You have bamboo lemurs. These adorable creatures spend their days eating bamboo shoots. Many of these shoots will be high in cyanide. So they're actually ingesting a poison that would, would actually kill most humans. But for some reason, they're able to tolerate that and digest it in similar ways that we see in panda bears. You, of course, have uh, Zabumafu, if anyone's familiar with that show. And this is the Kokorel Shafaka. And like uh, Stu is mentioning, this is one of those animals that can leap from tree to tree. And a similar version of this leaps into those spiny forests that you see in the southwest of Madagascar. The leaps can, can go from 8 to 10 meters. That's nearly 30 feet. And when they hit the ground, they do this awkward, weird jump that looks like a kangaroo practicing kung fu. 
Of course, there's more lemurs than this, including the largest lemur in the world that currently exists, which is the injury. And at the end of this, I'll show you a quick video of the sound they make. It's like they have a trumpet stuck in their throat. And this uh, big, beautiful lemur kind of looks like a, a two-year-old in a panda suit, lives in the eastern uh, rainforest of Madagascar. Sadly though, Madagascar is facing a big problem. 95% of lemurs are threatened with extinction. This actually makes them the most endangered group of animal that we measure. We have to figure out what to do about it. And the main issue is that we're losing forests rapidly. 50% of Madagascar's forests have been converted to something that's non-forest since the 1950s. And when I work, this is usually a result of fire and cattle grazing in the area. What happens is this creates grassland that, that is susceptible to erosion. These erosion scars, like that crack you see here, drains and erodes into bigger erosion scars or canyons that eventually drain into uh, watersheds. And those watersheds dump that topsoil into the bottom of the ocean. This is not good for lemurs or people. That topsoil would have been good for growing crops and also would have been good for maintaining forests. Of course, the situation in Madagascar is complex. You have a scenario where you have people who are living on the edge. They're, this biodiversity crisis is meeting a humanitarian crisis. And it's easy to point fingers at people, you know, because they're the ones cutting forests, burning burning down forests, etc. But really, this is, a, as Alison Jolly always, always said, it's a tragedy without villains. These are people who are trying to survive, trying to feed their families and make it from, from day to day. So myself and some colleagues from Madagascar started this organization called Planet Madagascar. We focus on conservation, community, and communication projects. And the aim is to improve the lives of people while maintaining and protecting and restoring habitat for lemurs. And one of the threats where I work is fire. So we have a network of fire breaks built by hand by people from communities who also go out and fight fires directly with shovels and uh, machetes. And they do this directly by hand. There's no water in this landscape, so they have to physically put out these fires. And you can see how exhausted they are after a hard day fighting fires and having built over 16 kilometers of fire break network to protect the forest that we're looking to restore into the future. That's 10 miles of fire breaks that they cut by hand. We also have a forest restoration initiative. So now that we're protecting this area from fires, we can take seeds from trees in the forest trees that that lemurs uh, especially eat and replant those back into the grassland areas in hopes of, of, of regenerating this forest. This provides a lot of income to members of communities. They don't have to go leave like those people who are doing fire breaks. So we can have women who are, uh, who are fixtures of communities um, working within their community so they don't have to leave their families. They can still take care of um, of the children and uh, and work together in these in these nurseries that we have throughout the communities we work. These nurseries are pumping out tens of thousands of seedlings, and we're putting in the ground about sixty thousand seedlings a year. Uh, these are then carried four kilometers into the grassland areas, where we plant them amongst the grasses in hopes of uh, eventually reseeding this area for forest. We have a number of communication and community projects. We have a women's cooperative that we helped develop who has now taken over much of our, our reforestation project. They, they nurse most of our seedlings that we, that we have uh, going into the ground and they help us plant them as well. We have a, an economic project, um, one of many, where we where we bring together um, ideas that the community is interested in trying, and we and we look to generate uh, finances for them. Um, for example, this beekeeping project that we have. We've recently started some women's health projects, and we also have some just general health projects where we bring a doctor in every six months to meet with the community. We also bring technology to conservation, so we're doing our mapping of lemurs, fires, and threats to the forest um, through uh, cellular telephones, and we can then in real time sort of keep track of what's going on. And of course, we have lots of different communication projects with children and adults, educating people about the importance of lemurs, why they're important to forests. Lemurs are important seed dispersers, so they spread the seeds of trees. And this is something that's important to share with people, but also to share about how fire is detrimental in many ways to communities and forests, but on the same time, recognizing that fire is also important to ecosystems. So looking to find balances between the amount of fire that's, that's going through savannas and forests. And we do this through education projects with kids. We've built a school in one of the communities. 
We also do radio programs and we do events with adults uh, and learning engagement um, experiences. So I'm gonna leave you with one short video of the injury making the sound that they make. And this is just uh, so you can get to understand the word lemur, which means spirits of the dead, the haunting calls that people heard when they arrived on this island, when, they, when the first sort of Westerners got there, they named these animals spirits of the dead. So let's listen up. <laughs> There you have it. All right, Travis, thank you so much for taking us into uh, that incredible world and then also sharing some of the really important work you're doing. I know uh, you've had some great accomplishments recently, like a school being built. Uh, and I know the community is doing so much better health-wise, financially, uh, since the work of Planet Madagascar, these, this community of villages in the area you work. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, we've been really privileged to be able to work with these communities. At the end of the day, they're helping us. You know, they're helping us conserve lemurs. They help us do research. And so it's almost, uh, um, it's it's a, you know, it's a privilege to be able to help the communities. But I think it's, it's you know, my job. <laughs> because without them, I wouldn't have the job I have as sure. a lemur researcher. All right. Well, I'm going to bring Stu in here. And we are going to take a few questions. We're going to find out our competition winners and then take a few more questions. So a few more things on deck today. Stu, let's get you back in here. Thanks. It's a pleasure. All right. So I want to bring a few classrooms in and give them a chance to ask a few questions. Then we'll dive into our competition winners and uh, we'll continue on with our Q&A session. So uh, if you're tuning in via YouTube, you may have noticed the chat wasn't working before. I pulled some strings behind the scenes. The chat is now working. So let me know where you're tuning in from, and you can send in your questions there. But let's get started with a few live questions here. I am going to start with, let's see, Mr. Steltman's crew is some fifth graders here in Ontario and Canada. Let's get them in front and center. There, the, Oh, that's the wrong crew. <laughs> oh, I don't see them. Maybe they had to duck out. Okay, let's try another one here. Let's go to New York. We've got some fifth graders in New York. Let's get them in here front and center. Hey, fifth graders, how are we doing? Hi. <laughs> All right, who's up? Um, have you ever got hurt in the spidey trees? That is such a good question. Um, honestly, I, it, it's kind of hard not to be because if you bump into those big spiny aloadia trees, you'll get lots of little spikes in you. Um, luckily, they're not too bad unless you really were to run into them, that, which would be really dangerous and you wouldn't want to do that. But yeah, to answer your question, hundreds of times, if you literally just try and pick up a branch, the spikes will, will, will prick you. I'm, I'm sure Travis has had some, <laughs> some experiences with, with those Alawadi and Pacapodiums and all those as well. Yeah, the trick is uh, if you feel something sharp to stop moving to figure out where you're getting poked <laughs> before you, you tear something. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Great question, fifth graders, to get us started. Let's go to another crew. This time we are going to spend a moment here with Miss Tarvin's crew. They are in Illinois. Let's get them in here front and center. Hey, Mrs. Tarvin, how are you doing today? We're good. How are you? Good, good. We are ready for you. Does anybody have a question? We, I have first graders, so we're um, we're we're trying. Do you have a question, Hunter? Okay. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I tried. I forgot one. Of them. That's okay. We'll come back to your crew, Mrs. Tarvin. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's grab another crew here. We're gonna go next door to a group in Hamilton. How are we doing today, Hamilton? Give me a big wave if you can hear and see us okay. All right. Well, let's get that uh, microphone unmuted and let's take a question. Oh, we hear you now. Yep, can you hear us now? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. So we had a question um, about 
One of our students had heard that ringtail lemurs mark their territory with their hands. Right. All right. Can we verify that? They do. Yeah, they have a number of scent glands. They have one that's just on the wrist, and they have a little notch that they can use, and they can they sort of rub and click uh, on on branches. They also have a, 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 another scent gland on the rear end, um, uh, just below their tail, and they'll use that to rub onto different places, and they'll rub their their tails. Um, I'm sure, Stuart, you've had the experience of seeing them. <laughs> you know, you must have been to those areas yourself. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's a really good question, by the way. Yeah, great question. Uh, let's see. Mrs. Eddie's Global Explorers are hanging out with us. Looks like they're having a recess snack too. Hey, Global Explorers. Hi. Here's my. Uh, um, we have a question from Clara. All right. My question is um, where do carnivorous plants fit into the food chain? That is a brilliant question. Um, so in Madagascar, there's there's two species of pitcher plants, um, about 10 species of sticky sundews. They're plants that have sticky leaves with droplets of glue that bugs get stuck to. And there's, I, I don't know exactly, but about 10 species of another group, or two groups actually, called Genlicia and Utricularia that basically suck in prey un underground. They have tiny little traps that suck in. The reality is they're very, very, very small part of the ecosystem. They're 0.1% or, or less than that of the plants of Madagascar. But in a few very specific niche habitats, they can be really dominant. Um, so the Nepenthes, the big pitcher plants, they grow in wetland areas, um, like on the, on the canals on the East Coast uh, or the Maswala Peninsula up in the north. And in those very few specific areas, they can be really dominant. They can absolutely cover small areas, but only in those tiny areas. Um, so to answer how your question, how they fit into the food chain, they're plants that turn the tables on animals. So they've evolved highly, highly modified leaves that trap and kill insects and other animals. And, and that group, not in Madagascar, but in parts of Borneo, there are, there are ones of the same family that can trap animals as big as rats. In Madagascar, they don't trap animals that big. The, the, the pitchers can, can trap, yeah, large insects, and not, not, any, not any vertebrates. But yeah, they, so they fit in the, the ecosystem in that sense. And that they, can, they can live in places where normal plants can't live by eating, eating animals. So they're pretty cool plants. All right. Thanks, Global Explorers. That was a great question. Yeah, it was. Uh, okay, we're going to take a question from YouTube, then we'll introduce our contest winner. So this is from 3AF Townlands in England, and they would really like to know two things. What is it like to live in Madagascar? And the second one is, have you seen a Nile crocodile? That might be Travis. <laughs> yeah, um, where, I, where I work, yes, the, there is lots of Nile crocodiles, so I have the, the fortune of, of seeing a lot of them. Um, and so they live uh, along this lake. Uh, it's a sacred lake and the crocodiles are considered important for that lake as well. Um, it was like living there where I work is, uh, is, uh, is dry forest. It's, uh, to me, it's incredible. I've, I've lived and worked in Southern Africa and Central America, but when I once, the very first time I drove to the national park I, I work in in Madagascar, I saw a lemur leaping across the parking lot and I turned to my wife and I said, we are never going anywhere else. This is it. This oh. is the place we're going to live. And we we have spent uh, countless years since 2007 in and out of the country. We go try to go every year as much as we can. I'll be there for a few months this year. And, you know, we talk about the biodiversity. And I know Stu will agree with me on this. That's incredible. That stuff's amazing. But the people of Madagascar are just a whole whole other thing. And I and I know you must have experienced the same thing. Yeah. And so that's what what brings me back to Madagascar a lot is is engaging with communities and people because they are just incredible. Absolutely. Couldn't couldn't agree more with you. Definitely. All right. We're gonna change gears for just a moment. Stu, I think you have a presentation queued up. Let's make some contest winner announcements. Okay, absolutely. Um okay, I'll I'll share my screen if that's okay can you yeah. can you see that coming through i see it there you just have to go full screen for me and we're good to go yeah beautiful all right i'm sorry it started at the beginning not at the competition sorry about that that's Let's okay down there quickly okay all righty so guys um schools across the world from australia to america to canada to to the uk have been sending in drawings of their favorite 
um, animals. We've had well over 600 just in the last few days. So I, we can't go through all of them, of course. The entries have been amazing this this uh, month. Thank you so, so much from Bayhababs to, to chameleons to, um, well, I, I think there's some beautiful lemurs there as well. You name it. You guys have done such a good job in researching and, um, and, and drawing these amazing animals and plants of Madagascar. As you might remember, so much so that, that we actually had planned to give a, a mini jungle, a collection of amazing exotic plants to the winning school. However, there's been so many amazing drawings this month that the judges thought we, we have to also uh, award three more prizes just because there's been so many wonderful drawings. So we've got a mini jungle for the winner and three runner-up prizes of exotic plants as well that we'll send out to those um, runner-up schools. So without further ado, um, one of the runners up was um, Oliver from Dines. Um, and Oliver had actually identified the plants and animals that he uh, had drawn. Um, he described a, a Madagascan periwinkle and this beautiful silk moth. So really, really congratulations, Oliver. I'll email you right after this call and, um, and you'll be getting your exotic plants soon. Another runner up, Benjamin from Melbourne School, uh, Melbourne St Andrews First School. Um, the judges loved this drawing of a panther chameleon. So really, really well done, Benjamin. Again, I'll, I'll email you in, um, just immediately after this, this nature hour and we'll get your exotic plants on the way. Uh, we had a beautiful drawing of a sleeping fusa um, for Merrin from Olberry School in, in the Shetland Islands. And again, congratulations. This is such a lovely, lovely uh, drawing. And the, the judges thought you used real imagination of, uh, of that beautiful fusa asleep. So really, really well done. But the winner of this mini jungle is 15 exotic plants that will send with all the misters and all the equipment and the, the, the gear that you need to grow them on your classroom windowsill. By coincidence, the winner was this beautiful drawing of this, this oil painting of an apenthes, of a, of a pitcher plant that we were just talking about. The judges thought the depths of color and the, the, the detail um, drawn by water from um, the Woodville Primary School was awesome. So many, many, many congratulations. We'll be in contact right after this, um, this call to send you your mini jungle and really congratulations to all the other, the, the three runner up prizes, prize winners and all of the other entries. Say there was over 600 in total and all of them deserve prizes because they were, they were all fantastic. So you all did such a good job. So many, many congrats. And we've got an II video as well coming up at some point uh, shortly as well that you can watch as well as, uh, um, as as part of this. So thank you so, so much, everyone, for, for taking part in this competition. So back to Joe. All right. Thank you so much. Wow. 600 plus. That's amazing. And that was short, a short period of time to get all yeah. the amazing uh, illustrations in. And I can only imagine the judges had a hard time picking uh, from so many great entries. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Let's grab a few more questions. And then we have a few other fun things to do in our call today. So in New Lowo, we've got some sixth and seventh graders spending time with us. Let me bring uh, their teacher here into the call. Uh, there we go. You are live in the stream, Mrs. Crow. If you can unmute and say hi, we'll see if your students have a question for us. All right. Here we go. Does anybody have a question? Let me see. Sometimes we're a bit of a quiet bunch. That's okay. I think your crew is joining you virtually today. Is that right? Yes, we're all here. We're good. Um, we are remote. We we are a remote class. So, okay. yes. Uh, does anybody have a question? Let me just check to see if maybe... Yeah. Well, they can send one in and you can also message me in the private chat uh, and just let me know if there's something there for us. All right. All right, guys. So go ahead and use that if you want. Okay. All okay. right. Very cool. So let's grab another question here from YouTube that we have teed up. This is a group in Cornwall in the UK and they want to know how far we talked about lemurs. So how far can they jump? Uh, upwards of eight to 10 meters. Uh, so that's nearly wow. 30 feet. So that's, um, it's the furthest jumping animal in terms of just sheer distance um, that, that we have on the planet. Yeah. And it's also how they land as well. I've never, 
ever understood how they can land on some of those spiny forest trees. It's unbelievable how, how agile they are and how, how good at landing they are. So yeah, they're incredible. Okay, let's follow up with a couple of our camera classrooms. Miss Cottrell's fifth graders, do you have a follow-up for us? I bet you do. You guys always have lots of questions in New York. Hi, I'm Anson. Uh, do you think that Madagascar should be a continent? Well, if I get to choose, then sure, why not? But I believe that it actually wasn't once its own continent. Um, but I think because of the nature of plate tectonics, I believe it has fused to the African continent itself. Um, so it's no longer technically a continent, um, but we still talk about it that way because it once was and it's it's very much like it is, you know, because yeah. it was by itself. I don't know if that would be the how you'd see it, Stu. Yeah, yeah. So it was part of Gondwana, this super continent that once included Africa, um, uh, Australia, Antarctica, part, most of South America uh, and also India, actually, as well. Um, but yeah, Tarifus is absolutely right. It's called it the eighth continent as, as kind of a nickname, just really because it kind of ecologically, it's so different. It kind of deserves to be because it, it, it it's, it's not just a little island with a few unique animals or plants. It's basically a continental ecosystem in that sense. It's got an entire range of unique habitats um, and, and literally or tens of thousands of unique plants and animals that occur nowhere else. So in the context of its endemism, the unique animals and plants that live there, it's definitely comparable to a continent. I mean, it's got tens of thousands of times more endemic species than, than Antarctica, for example. So in that sense, yeah, it, it's, it's like a little continent on its own. But Travis is absolutely right. Technically, it's not. It's part of Africa. But ecologically, it, it, you could consider it like that. Yeah. All right. That's a good question. Global Explorers, do you have a follow up for us? I think I see someone getting their hoodie on. Maybe they're oh. already with a question. Uh, nope. <laughs> anyone has a question? Can I ask? Okay. Um, where do you, you know how you go to Madagascar and blah, blah, blah. Where do you stay? Like, isn't oh, it just. True. Yeah. Well, Madagascar is a, a, a big country. There's hotels, there's lodges, um, there's wonderful people as well. So, so to be honest, it depends where you are. Um, but if you're in really remote areas, like climbing different mountains, I had to climb a mountain recently called Mount Marajeje, where there's, there is no lodges or accommodations at all. So in those cases, you have to camp and sleep in hammocks or tents, depending where you're going. But Madagascar is a, a big, big country with lots of towns and villages, and they have beautiful little lodges and hotels and hostels all, all around the country. So in most places, you stay in them. But if you're going to really remote areas, then you have no choice but to camp, which is really good fun and really amazing as well. Yeah. All right. Great question. Uh, GL Armstrong, and then we're going to do a little, a little extra action here. GL Armstrong, do you have one more question for us? There they are, waving, waving. Let's get their <laughs> mic unmuted if they have a question. Yep, here they come. There we go. Oh, I know why. There we go. Okay, GL Armstrong, we're ready. Sure. We were actually just curious about I mean, all these amazing creatures. Do you have a personal favorite? Is there one that like you just connect with? Uh, for, for me, I, I'm going to steal something I heard from a friend and naturalist, Brian Keating. Whatever m animal I'm looking at at the moment is the favorite that I'm interested in. Um, but I do have a sweet spot. You can see I have an image over here of, of Kokrao Shabaka. So you, you might be able to suggest that might be my favorite based on how many things and photos of those around my house I have. But everything's just so weird. I, it's so hard to pick. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I think my one would be those tiny, weeny little chameleons. If, if you look at your hand, if you put your hand in front of you and then turn your thumb over, those chameleons can be about the size of your the nail on your thumb, literally just your tiny little nail on your thumb. And again, remember, they're not insects, they're vertebrates. They've got blood vessels, little bones in their backbone, their vertebrae eyes they've got a beating heart inside their body it is unbelievable to think how small they are so i, I agree with travis definitely every animal is, is amazing in its own right but I, I love those little guys they're so cool 
<laughs> All right. Well, these questions have been absolutely great. There's a fifth grade class in Pennsylvania, Ms. Capisi's crew, who are asking us about the II. But that question, hold tight, is going to be answered in the video we're going to play to wrap up the event today. Stu, these events always go so quickly. We have so much great content. No. I think what we should do now, if you're up for it, is talk a little bit about Darwin 200 and the next event we have coming up in this 10 event series. And we'll end the event. We'll play everyone out with the II uh, and they can learn about that amazing species. Okie dokie. All righty. So you, I, I've shared my that up there. Okay, we're ready for you. very kindly mentioned starting in august this year we're taking an incredible ship called Ustaskilde right the way around the world following the journey of charles darwin we're going to do 100 events one every week for two years so for 100 weeks as the ship goes around the world they're called the world's most exciting classroom and every single week we're going to have amazing events with with projects experiments activities competitions the winning class will get a free tickets for the entire class and their teachers to meet the ship in the Galapagos, which is a pretty cool prize. Um, so you've got to take part in these 100 events that start this August, start, um, yeah, late August 2023. Basically, what we're doing, we're taking this beautiful ship right the way around the world, following Charles Darwin's journey, visiting every single port, major port that Charles Darwin went to nearly 200 years ago when he undertook his his voyage upon the HMS Beagle, the ship that took him around the world. And we're going to be beaming live everywhere from South Georgia all the way to, to the tropics and the rainforests of Brazil. So we really hope you'll enjoy um, this, the, the Darwin 200 project. If you want to learn more, you can look at www.darwin200.com and you'll see all about it there. Um, well, for next month, we're going to the island of Komodo home to the famous Komodo dragons. These are the most, some of the most incredible reptiles on earth. They look like dinosaurs, but they're not, of course. Um, they're not in any way dinosaurs, but, but they look like dinosaurs. They can grow well over four meters in length with their huge tails. They're kind of the, the most ferocious land vertebrates or land predators you can imagine. They've got venom in their saliva. They've got armor-plated studded skin. They've got tw 20 razor sharp claws. They've got a whip tail. They've got powerful jaws and razor sharp teeth. They are just built to kill. And we're going to hear some really incredible stories about these animals, what it's like conserving them. But also you've got to be extremely careful because people do get attacked and, and even killed by them. So the conservationists as well have to be very, very careful conserving these amazing animals. And the islands that they come from, this is Padar, one of the Komodo group, just look like something out of a storybook. They're just unbelievable islands. So we're going to be looking at Komodo. Then the coming months, this is my particular study area, the Lost Worlds of Venezuela, the, the Tepui or Tepui Mountains, home to unbelievable landscapes. Then Eta Ale from Ethiopia, the lava lakes and the sulfur landscapes out there. And uh, yeah, then, uh, then, uh, then many other locations. But for now, though, we're back to our beautiful Madagascar and are going to hear a, a little video all about the II. So a massive, massive thank you to everyone for listening today. All right, all right. Stu, Travis had to duck out for an appointment. So a huge shout out to Travis Steffens. Check out planetmadagascar.com if you want to learn a little bit more about the amazing work that he is doing. Uh, a lot of our class, a few of our classrooms have had to head out for recess, but we still have a few backstage. So before we play the video, I want to give a big shout out to some of our classrooms who are joining us live. As always, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today and in your classrooms. Very, very cool. Uh, and yeah, like Stu mentioned, we have such a great video to play us out. The II in Madagascar. I watched it yesterday. I think you're going to love it. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody and get this video up uh, and running here for us. So just bear with me while it loads. Uh, and then we are going to enjoy this together. So thanks so much, everyone. Stu, great to see you as always. Uh, and we're going to sign off for this Darwin 200 Nature Hour event. Madagascar is sometimes called an ark of unique life, for there's nowhere else quite like it on Earth. 
This enormous island separated from mainland Africa millions of years ago. Today, Madagascar harbors countless unique species found nowhere else on the planet. Entire groups of organisms evolved and diversified here, including lemurs, chameleons, and countless insects and plants, all part of this lost world of unique life. The forests of Madagascar are also home to an incredible species of the lemur family. This is the most strange animal on the whole island of Madagascar. This species only comes out at dark, so it's quite difficult to see. But one of the best places in all of Madagascar to find it is a little island located just over there. So let's jump in the boats and see if we can find it tonight. The animal I'm searching for once occurred across much of Madagascar, but it's been killed throughout most of its range for nothing other than its fearful appearance, which has led to it being known as Madagascar's demon lemur. For over 10 years, I've hoped to see this animal in the wild. It was well into the night by the time I reached the island. This is the home of Madagascar's demon lemur. It's very shy and very difficult to find, but some have been spotted up on a little hill up here on this island. With a bit of luck, we'll find it. The forests of this island teem with wildlife. Nocturnal lemurs peer from the branches. But this isn't the creature I've come here to see. To stand a chance of seeing the demon lemur, we have to proceed very quietly. A team of guides put several coconuts down here in the trees in front of me. With a bit of luck, some of the eyes on this island might smell the coconuts and hopefully be attracted down and feed on them. We have to be really silent, because if we make any noise, the eyes will hear it and not come. So let's watch and see what happens. Suddenly, something moves in the darkness. Madagascar's demon lemur, the Ai Ai. For hundreds of years, local beliefs across Madagascar have held this creature to be a bad omen. In many parts of the country, it's still believed today that when an Ai Ai appears at a village, a child will die, or there'll be a bad harvest. And so Ai Ai's are killed whenever they're seen and put up on stakes to ward off evil spirits and other eyes. With their strange wiry fur, huge eyes and bat-like ears, it's easy to see where this superstition comes from. But far from being a demon of the forest, in reality, eyes are shy and they have many amazing adaptations. The eye, eye is one of the most specialized of all species of lemurs. Just check out its middle finger. It has a unique, really thin, almost skeletal finger, which it uses to winkle insect grubs out of holes in trees and logs. Or here, to reach the milk of a coconut through a hole. No other animal on Earth has an appendage quite like this. Just look at that finger. Isn't it weird?
it's really easy to see why the Aya is called the Demon Lemur. This creature of darkness is one of the strangest mammals on the planet. No other lemur has a tail quite like this, or such strange long but thin hair. But these traits give the Aya balance and allow it to be an excellent climber in these tropical forests. And of course, its huge brown saucer-like eyes enable the Aya to see brilliantly in the dark, far better than my camera can record. My time observing the Aya was brief, and soon it disappeared back into the forest, melting into the darkness. Unfortunately, Aya's coming into villages across much of Madagascar is still seen as a bad omen. But local belief has it that if you go out into the forest and actively kill an Aya, it brings even worse luck. With this local belief, hopefully, the few Aya's that remain will stay safe and have a secure future in Madagascar's remaining protected forests.